the Second World War was fought on the seas, in the air and on the land, but it was also fought in the kitchen. In 1939, Britain was heavily dependent on imports for about half of her food, 50% of meat, 80% of fruit and 90% of cereals were imported. The war placed increasing demands mentally and physically on people. There was a big increase in heavy industry requirements. There was an increase in hours worked through overtime or also, of course, through fire watching. <coughs> Shift work, night work required more calories than daytime and women now entered the workforce in large numbers. <coughs> To add to the problems of agriculture, large numbers of workers now left the land and joined the armed forces. Industry concentrates more and more on producing war weapons and not on agricultural machinery. There were competing demands between the use of chemicals for fertilizers on the one hand or munitions on the other. And there were also competing demands for shipping capacity between food and munitions. Whereas before the war, some people might have claimed that they lived to eat. Now it was a question for almost everybody of eating to live. People didn't any longer go into a shop and say, I want some, but rather they asked the question, have you got any? The food situation could be tackled in three major ways. We could continue to depend on imports. and We look at that section first. Secondly, British agriculture could, could be improved. And thirdly, the man or woman in the street could do their bit by growing their own. So first of all, the supply from overseas, which continued throughout the war, to be extremely important, but there were major problems. There was a lack of shipping and competing demands between cargoes. A sudden burden was, port, was placed on west coast ports, the Clyde, the Mersey, the Bristol Channel, which at least in theory were less vulnerable to attack than ports on the east. Storage facilities at the ports were often inadequate and there were very few inland sorting depots before 1942. There were not enough heavy lift cranes to go around and there were often very poor industrial relations between workers and dock authorities, particularly in Glasgow. There was the major problem of German submarines and 2,400 merchant vessels were sunk during the war. This one fortunately came back, the Baron Renfrew, fortunately because my father was first mate on her for part of the war. Here's the Merchant Navy Memorial in London. 30,000 merchant seamen lost their lives. And here's the memorial much closer to home at South Shields. Well, the U-boat threat was certainly very real, but Dernitz, the commander of the U-boat fleet, had only 57 U-boats at the beginning of the war, and his request for 300 was turned down by Hitler, rather fortunately for us. However, let's be clear that at no point in the war were the British ever threatened with hunger, let alone starvation. In 1939, we had imported about 30 million tonnes of food. By 1945, however, this had decreased, thanks to our Merchant Navy and Royal Navy, this figure had decreased to about 10 million. There were three, at least three, critical periods in the struggle 
to keep the supply lines over the Atlantic open. The first was autumn 1940, referred to in German as Die Glückliche Zeit, the happy time when U-boats had some of their major successes against very weak enemy. In 1940, nearly 6,000 seamen died, and by February 1941, we were losing ships three times as fast as they could be built, and the Luftwaffe from the air took a heavy toll on docks, warehouses, and transport links. A lack of dock storage space leads to goods piling up on the quays, and this, of course, will lead to severe wastage. But the real problem was more in the distribution from the ports. West to east rail links were often poor, and this led to problems with eastern flour mills, which could run out of grist from time to time. Raw material shortages led to ships which normally carried food being used instead to transport steel. But these heavy cargoes damaged ships, particularly in severe winter storms, and led to long delays for repair in British yards. A lack of skilled workers and obsolete equipment in the yards further aggravated these problems. Another problem was military competition for shipping space. With the Mediterranean closed, ships then faced a 20,000 kilometre journey around South Africa in order to supply our troops in the Eastern Mediterranean. In order to speed up this process, fast refrigerated ships were used, further adding to the food problem especially that of meat. Heavy bombing raids on warehouses led to the situation in January 1941, when only two weeks of reserved stocks of frozen meat remained in British warehouses. Meat rations were reduced to about a pound a week, eked out with poorer cuts and offal. The second time of crisis was the autumn and winter of 1940 to 41. In fact, this was probably the hardest period. Mass observation reports, people saying that they're not starving, but usually well stocked shops had an empty and anxious air. Housewives are queuing for essential foods, prices are rising and the outlook looked very grim indeed. In September 1940, the London Blitz commenced, but fortunately the West Coast ports were not attacked until later in February 1941, with the heaviest raids then being in May. Liverpool is bombed on eight successive nights. 3,900 are killed and 10,000 homes destroyed. At one point, only 12 deep sea berths out of 130 were left operational. However, then no more raids took place immediately, and it was civilians rather than the war effort who suffered most. Imports were not materially affected, except for timber, to any great extent. At Liverpool, loss of imports amounted to only 12,000 tonnes, out of a total of 30 million tonnes in 1941. And it raises the question that if the Luftwaffe had concentrated on the transport systems, the road and rail networks that maintained the ports, if they had been more precise in their bombing, and if they had had sufficient resources to attack the Clyde, the Mersey and the Bristol ports simultaneously, well, the results might have been very different indeed. Two important developments now take place. In March 1941, Churchill set up the Battle of the Atlantic Committee to run and coordinate the work of the docks 
under regional port directors, and 40,000 shipyard workers are released from the forces to carry out essential ship repair. The second development concerns the agreement with America over land lease. This means that imports can now be given priority over exports, speeding up the situation enormously. British ships can be repaired in American yards as well as in British yards. Land lease provided reliable supplies of food. It was no longer necessary for imports to be paid for immediately with exports, a situation which had led to long turnarounds by ships. Uh, one serious problem, however, was that the food supply from America was heavily dependent on the diplomatic skills of the men of the British food mission stationed in Washington. However, Churchill, probably wrongly, had prioritised food imports over raw materials. And this led to disputes over the necessary level of food stocks required to be kept in British warehouses. And this situation soured Anglo-American relations and led to charges of British hypochondria over our food supplies. And then came the third period of crisis in the autumn and winter again of 1941 to 1942. Another critical time, there's a conflict over meat supplies with the USA, and this con coincides with a crisis in British shipping. There has been an increase in U-boat construction, bringing numbers to near 300 and shipping losses, British shipping losses, reach a peak of 700,000 tonnes in November 1941. There are American build-ups of troops and supplies in anticipation of the invasion of Europe, which would not come, of course, until 1944. But the Americans were extremely unwilling to prioritise food imports over their own military requirements. At the same time, preparations were underway for Operation Torch, the landings in North Africa, and this adds to the strain on existing shipping capacity. And the USA also began shipping 500,000 tonnes of food every month to the USSR. The situation is made all the worse, with American military authorities refusing to allow military coal stores to be used for civilian export cargoes, with the result that huge quantities of frozen food sit rotting on American East Coast docks. <clears throat> As a part solution to this problem, the American War Shipping Administration suggests diverting Australian meat away from Britain to American troops who were already stationed in Australia and New Zealand. America then will pledge to make up this shortfall by shipping frozen meat over the Atlantic. A huge time saving, of course, on the long route from Australia to Great Britain. Uh, nevertheless, by January 43, the Americans were only delivering half of the promised 40,000 tonnes of frozen meat. The British War Cabinet is warned that Britain was consuming three quarters of a million tonnes more goods than she was importing, and that within two months, supplies would be exhausted. Uh, President Roosevelt, is finally persuaded to divert quarter of a million tonnes of frozen meat destined for the USSR to Britain. And meat rushing is introduced into the United States in March 1943, despite fierce opposition. Lord Woolton, Minister of Food, more about him in a minute or two, led, was led to the conclusion that we, we honoured the ration 
but it was a near thing at the time. But then from about spring 1942, the situation begins to stabilize. On the industrial front, before the war, Thompson's of Sunderland shipyards had designed a standard steamship that was easy to build and to operate. The design, the revolutionary design, was then taken to America, where several thousand of these ships were produced. And if there's any one man we must be thankful to for this, it's a Henry Kaiser. He had no previous experience of shipbuilding, but that didn't stop him. He began to mass produce prefabricated parts and he used welding techniques instead of riveting. There were 18 massive Kaiser shipyards around the United States employing vast numbers in far from ideal conditions and work went on of course around the clock. And here's the little ship that he designed and built. The purpose of these emergency type of cargo ships was to maintain the supply of food and munitions to Britain, and they therefore became known as the Liberty Ships. Uh, by that spring of 1942, it took just two months to build a Liberty ship, and this was later reduced to 42 days. Each ship could carry 10,000 tonnes, and by the start of 43, new construction produced 1.5 million tonnes more shipping than was actually being sunk. The balance was turning. There's one little ship, the Robert E. Peary. It was launched just four days and 15 and a half hours after the keel had been laid at Richmond, California in November 1942. Things were improving then on the industrial front, but also on the military front with the development of radar and the cracking of the German Enigma codes so that we knew more or less where the submarines were. So to sum up, our imports came from various countries. They came perhaps principally from America, And here we see one of the most famous imports, but from America came frozen and canned meat, such as Spam, an invention, if you like, of a company called Hormel, Hormel Spiced Ham, who had developed this type of meat in 1937. So from America come frozen and canned meat, canned fish, canned and dried egg, dried fruits, and there were also fats and oils and wheat for bread flour. From Argentina came food, also now processed before export, which reduced the bulk but increased the value. Beef was pressed into corned beef. The Icelandic fishing industry was revived to a great extent extent but unfortunately it tended to exploit its position and put fish beyond the reach of most ordinary people. Fish remained a scarce and expensive commodity. Commonwealth countries played an enormous part as well. They showed how flexible they could be and many of them restructured their agriculture to help the British food situation. In Australia, they experiment, experimented with meat that was dehydrated as an emergency food reserve. Not a great success though. It turned out into an unpleasant lumpy grey mince when reconstituted and the experiment had to be abandoned. Canada came to replace Denmark as Britain's supplier of bacon. 
And in New Zealand, they had begun by concentrating on butter of Great Britain. Well, butter contains calories, but little protein. They were then asked and changed to the production of cheese as a priority. Cheese contains more protein, calcium and phosphorus. But then they changed back to butter again when Japanese occupation of Southeast Asia cut off the supply of vegetable oil for margarine. Well, processing was a brilliant invention, but it didn't exactly lead to savoury appetising food. Would you fancy dried egg? The very worst breakfast, we were told, was a two inch block of hard scrambled egg oozing with water which saturated the half slice of so-called toast beneath it and the taste ugh, when you scrambled dried eggs and dropped them they bounced the processed cheese was no better it was a soapy product with no consistency unfit to eat raw dried banana powder was yet another delight as well as importing food britain had two other choices first we look at how british farming responded to the new situation in the 1930s most land in great britain had been under pasture and this meant that it took 10 acres of grassland for stock raising and you could feed 12 people if you put the same 10 acres under wheat you fed about 200 people and if you put 10 acres to the growing of potatoes that would feed some 400 people so it was pretty obvious that we had to start ploughing up a lot of land. Restructuring plans involve reducing livestock and ploughing up the land for wheat, sugar beet and in particular potatoes which are a source of starchy energy and vitamin C and they will come to play a very important role in the British diet. The number of acres under arable cultivation would rise from 12 million in 1939 to about 18 million at the end of the war. <clears throat> By 1941, it was decided to reduce the imports of animal feed heavily. Dairy cattle will now have priority and livestock farmers must become self-sufficient and grow their own grains. There were some improvements in mechanisation. In 1939, only about one in six farmers had a tractor. By the end of the war, there were about four times as many tractors on British farms. Um, and in particular, there was the Fordson tractor, not the finest of tractors, rather temperamental in some ways, built here at Dagenham, or also imported from the USA under lend lease. Another area that was addressed was the availability of fertilizers. Unfortunately, much of the new arable land put under the plough in Britain was poor in phosphoric acid. To respond to this problem, Canada extended its phosphate and nitrogen industries and synthetic nitrogen plants were also established. The USSR also played an important part by supplying potash, and it came to Great Britain by an incredibly long route across Siberia and the USA and the Atlantic Ocean. And nevertheless, the main cause of increased yields seems to have been hard manual work and longer hours rather than technical improvements. About a hundred thousand farm labourers were called up in the war 
And this, of course, drastically reduced the quantity of labour uh, for agricultural work. The shortfall was, however, reduced in several ways. There were about 58,000 prisoners of war employed on the land. There were working holidays at agricultural workers' camps, and children were sent on farm camp holidays. But the largest contribution was made by the Women's Land Army, which numbered some 80,000 women by 1944. And here we can see Land Army girls working away. This, by the way, was not a new idea. At the end of the First World War, there had been some 200,000 women working on the land. Well, in the Second War, most childless or unmarried women were required to make a contribution, a very important and vital contribution to the war effort. And it seems that many city girls were drawn to the WLA. The girls would live sometimes in hostels, sometimes with the farmers or in billets for which they had to pay out of their own wage. And tasks covered the full range of agricultural work. It must have been a rude awakening for many girls. You would have to get used to rat catching, thatching, cutting reeds and making charcoal. There was no doubt homesickness, loneliness, and sometimes exploitation of the girls, but there must have also been fun and comradeship. There are several funny stories about how the girls got on. There was the rather naive would-be recruit who wanted to learn to milk, but would have liked to have begun practicing on a calf. There's Peggy at a horticultural college, who says that they, the team, had a rather fierce bore. One of us used to dangle some pig swill in a bucket on the end of a belt, while I climbed over a fence to tip the other bucket full into the trough. Unfortunately, I often didn't make it back and the boar bit me on the bottom. Well, there was Vera Campbell's experience of washing in Scotland. Pump the water into an old zinc bath used for boiling scraps for poultry and the pig. Wash top half of body, dry, put on warm jersey and try to sit in the bath for the lower part of the body, pretty grim in cold weather. The state intervened more and more in the life of in the daily life of people and the ministry of food was to play a vital role in policy a valuable alliance was forged between a jack drummond the ministry's chief scientific advisor and sir fred marquis or lord woolton who we've already briefly met Jack Drummond was a small, neat, sprightly gay man who was tragically murdered in 1952. In June 1940, a scientific subcommittee on food policy was set up, led by Jack. He had led research on butter and margarine substitutes and on infant feeding. A plan was drawn up to try to ensure a nutritionally balanced wartime diet with imported frozen and canned meat and calcium rich dairy products being given priority. And Lord Woolton had a gift for persuading people, informing people, but without cajoling. He had a sense of humour. At Christmas in 1942, Lord Woolton held a potato Christmas fair in the gutted shell of John Lewis Department Store, Oxford Street. 
The fair was to extol the virtues of potatoes over imported wheat, and he attends the fair along with a baby elephant called Comet. Lord Woolton was a businessman and a philanthropist, chairman of Lewis's department store in Liverpool and later chairman of the Conservative Party. And unusually for a civil servant, he had received a scientific education and was convinced that rickets, dental decay and other diseases of malnutrition or neglect are preventable. He was aware in particular that malnutrition hit women during their childbearing years particularly hard. He says that he was determined to use the powers he possessed to stamp out the diseases that arose from malnutrition, especially those among children. So, a pregnant and nursing mothers would now receive as a priority a pint of milk a day at tuppence a pint. Children under one received two pints a day, and in December 1941, all children under two are offered an allowance of black currant and then later orange juice and Icelandic cod liver oil. But in January 1942, it was found that only one fifth of those eligible were actually collecting their allocation. In 1941, the milk in school scheme and school dinners were introduced, and they provided about a third of a child's daily energy needs. By the end of the war, in fact, it was considered perfectly normal that all children should receive a school meal and a free bottle of milk. The social stigma that had attached, had been attached to free school meals had been removed. Welfare was no longer seen so much as a special service for the needy, but as a social service for all. White bread had, before the war, accounted for about 90% of consumption. But due to the shipping crisis of 1942, the government was finally forced to ban white bread, in which the wheat germ, which is the source of vitamins, iron and protein, was removed. The wheat germ-rich wholemeal national loaf high in iron and vitamin B, became the only available bread. There was a problem. The phytic acid in wholemeal bread reduced the body's ability to absorb calcium. The solution is to tamper, if you like, with the bread by adding calcium carbonate or phosphate to wholemeal flour. And each loaf would contain 120 milligrams of calcium per 100 grams of national wholemeal flour. But it wasn't always easy to persuade the British public to accept these changes to their diet. A hotel chef in Birmingham is reported uh, now working in a factory canteen. He's reported that he tried to cheer up a dish of boiled beef and carrots by adding an exotic white sauce. There were protests and salads and savouries were refused by the workers. What the workers want was fish and chips, cream cakes, bread and butter and brown gravy poured over everything. The poor chef concludes that Birmingham people do not understand food. So we've now looked at how Britain imported a large quantity of food throughout the war, how British agriculture adapted to the new situation, and finally we come to see how the, the little man or woman in the street adapted and played their part. Here's a street scene from Derby. If you walked along the street, what might you see? <clears throat> well, you probably wouldn't see the Anderson shelters, 
with the vegetables growing on the top in many gardens. If you peeped over the fences, you wouldn't see many flowers. Gardens were turned over more and more to vegetable growing. You might well see a rabbit hutch or chicken coops in backyards. You could smell chicken feed being cooked. And you can certainly see in the picture one of the pig bins on the street corners for food scraps. If you were very lucky, you might be able to pick up a bit of horse manure left after the Coleman's cart had been down your street. And one of the very important things that people could do was to start digging and growing their own food in their gardens or allotments or small holdings. By 1942, about 50% of householders were growing at least some of their own veg. The campaign organised by the government reached a peak in 1943 when about one and a half million allotments were being worked. It wasn't a new idea, by the way. In the First World War, there had been also about one and a half million allotments by 1917. However, previously, there had been a social stigma attached to having the allotment. They had been so seen as something for the poor to occupy their spare time. And this uh, earlier attitude would have implications. How would the government persuade people to start growing their own? It will require a carefully managed, tactful public relations campaign in which the media will play a very important role. A modest urban allotment might run to potatoes, a few runner beans and some tomatoes. In the countryside, however, with more space available, crop yields could be quite high and surplus produce could become available. And this is where the women's institutes played a very important role indeed. The National Federation of WIs coordinated activity nationwide with a very able health help of a Miss Elizabeth Hess, a very good German name. Miss Elizabeth Hess, Hess was the Federation's agricultural advisors. The WIs played a leading role in growing produce, raising livestock, preservation of fruit and in distribution. Their activities were varied and many. They would clear vacant plots. Sometimes, as you can see in the picture here, a former bomb plot in East London. I can't guarantee that these ladies are WI, but nevertheless, we get the point. The WI would clear vacant plots and waste ground and turn it over to cultivation. They would give talks and demonstrations and organise classes. Uh, one class was called Pig into Pork, and it covered topics from the curing of the pig to the making of sausages and preparing of brawn from the head. Nothing will go to waste. The WI collected medicinal plants, foxgloves, dandelions, nettles, or rose hips, important for their vitamin C content. They are, the WI, perhaps best known for their jam making from surplus fruit that would have been, would have gone to waste. Jam is easy to store and adds taste to a very monotonous diet. And here we can see a group of Welsh ladies hard at work on the process. This was 
possibly the WI's greatest achievement, bottling and canning of fruit. The organization developed 5,800 preservation centers and many members became skilled operators of canning machines. Canning is apparently quite a complex operation and the USA donated six mobile canning vans to the WI. I'm not sure I'd have really liked to have worked in one of the canning vans. They were painted grey, mounted on a Ford V8 chassis. They were equipped with well-arranged cupboards and shelves, a copper heated with colour gas and a zinc-lined sink. A trestle table held a hand-sealing machine. On the roof of the van stood the water tank. If you like dripping heat, cramped space and perspiring companions, this is just the place for you. It fell largely to the WI to implement schemes for the disposal of food surpluses, often through market stalls. Plans were also put in place to organise collection centres where produce was graded and redirected to the green grocery trade. Any urban surplus was usually given to hospitals or community institutions. In October 1939, the government launched the Grow More Food campaign to encourage people to use their gardens or allotments to grow veg. You can see in the picture, the right technique is being used left foot on the spade. The slogan, Grow More Food, was not very exciting and it was changed to Dig for Victory probably by a gentleman called Michael Foote, later to become leader of the Labour Party. Michael Foote, during the war, was a fiery left-winger writer for London's Evening Standard. And the title Dig for Victory suggests a link between domestic labour and defeat of the Nazis. A kitchen front, just as vital as a war front. Initially, the campaign made a slow start, and with the phony war, the early part of the war, there was certainly an amount of apathy. The small gardener faced several problems, apart from the obvious hard physical work that digging entails. But there were also no weather forecasts, and the gardener would often find strips of metallic foil on the soil, which were difficult to remove. The foil had been dropped by German planes and it was designed to interfere with radio communication. There were, however, notable early achievements. Large sections of London parks and parks here in Newcastle were turned over to uh, vegetable plots. The boundaries of Aintree Racecourse were dug up for veg. Anderson shelters and people's gardens with their 15 inches of topsoil were ideal for growing veg and inside the shelters mushrooms would thrive in the damp conditions. On the 10th of May 1940 Churchill became a prime minister and a new sense of urgency is obvious with the appointment of a Robert Hudson Ministry of Agriculture and Lord Woolton, Ministry of Food. These two demystify the idea of growing your own and they simplify administration. Their campaign, the Dig for Victory campaign, stresses these advantages. There'll be pleasure in enjoying good food. You'll keep the family fed. You'll have a leisure and social activity and you'll be playing your part in defeating Hitler. Information was disseminated in so many ways. The government published 
a number of pamphlets, pamphlets called Dig for Victory, which ended up being a veritable horticultural encyclopedia from number one, Guide to All Year Round Planting, to the final one, number 26, How to Use Cloches. The government organised talks and demonstrations and shows that took place around the country. One of the stars of these shows was a certain Godfrey Basley, a former butcher who had worked for the BBC. He then became a civil servant, travelling around the Midlands with a van and loudspeaker, offering advice on how to grow vegetables. He then returned to the BBC and devised a new radio programme called The Archers. The government published a series of booklets called Gardeners Are Asking. Here are two of the questions sent in by readers. How can I stop cats roaming over my allotment? Answer, with garden pepper dust or catapult. Second question, an incendiary bomb fell through the roof of my shed and all my vegetables are now covered with grey powder. Will they be fit to eat? Answer. If you wash the veg very thoroughly, they should be all right, but there is no experience to guide us on this point. The press played a vital role in the dissemination of information. They published an article on a regular basis called Food Facts. And they advertised it like this. If he, that would be hubby, if he's fed up with his food, she gets the blame. But there are always new ideas about in Food Facts. It's in all the papers every week. And then there were the adverts. Here's Mrs. Peake's pudding. What a wonderful effect they had on marriage relations. Oh dear, that poor couple, a cold dinner again, the man complains. Fortunately, the wife has a friend who whispers, why don't you try Peake's, Mrs. Peake's puddings? And all is well. The husband, the hardworking husband, comes home to a delicious pudding all is well again. Or, if you suffer from insomnia, Born Vita will put you right. The tide of sleep laps gently over you. And then, then there were at least two famous cartoon characters. Here we see Potato Pete, the energy food, I make a good soup. And there was a little poem that Potato Pete had written. Those who have the will to win, cook potatoes in their skin, knowing that the sight of peelings deeply hurts Lord Woolton's feelings. There was also Dr. Carrot. He was dreamed up to deal with a surplus of a hundred thousand tons of carrots in 1942. And the government claim that carrots will help you to see better in the blackout, just like pilots. The real reason, in fact, was to divert attention from the relatively new invention of radar, which allowed pilots to see but the government didn't want the Germans to realise that radar was now in an advanced state of development. There were many posters, bold and simple design. Famous artists are employed like Henry Moore or Edward Ardizzoni. One of them, Boots on the Spade, 1941, was reproduced four million times. The artist was one Tom Jones. And here's an equally famous one, We Want Your Kitchen Waste, designed by John Gilroy, born in Newcastle. 
He also produced posters like Careless Talk Costs Lives and Make Do and Mend. The radio, or perhaps I should say the wireless, was the medium of the war. I can see them now. It was a collective experience, the whole family sitting round the wireless. In the messages disseminated through the, the radio were given out with humour and homeliness, very different to similar messages in Nazi Germany. For Lord Woolton, his idea of an ideal radio audience was something like this. He says that he always kept a picture of a man in a cottage house, sitting without a collar, with slippers on at the end of the day's work, with children playing on the rug, with his wife washing up in an adjoining room with the door open. And a visitor arrived in the middle of my broadcast. If I was fortunate and successful, the man said, sit down and shut up. We are listening to Woolton. Here we meet a Mr. Middleton. He had a radio programme called In Your Garden. He was the BBC's avuncular chief gardening broadcaster. He has a gentle manner and gives homely advice to Britain's gardeners. He had previously worked for the Board of Agriculture during the First War. Uh, he had been a horticultural instructor and started his broadcasting in 1931. In September 1934, he got his own programme in your garden, and in 1937, he made the first TV gardening broadcast from Alexandra Palace, London. However, apparently, he wasn't very popular with his neighbours because his own garden at Princes Avenue in Surbiton was the least well maintained in the street. Do you remember these two programmes? Well, they appeared in a programme called The Kitchen Front, broadcast every morning for only five minutes at 8.15 but often using celebrities like Tommy Handley of Itmar fame, or here Elsie and Doris Waters, who invented the characters of Gert and Daisy, two lovable Cockney charwomen. The programme has great humour and offers handy tips that can be used at once, ideally while somebody is out doing the shopping that very day. Of course, the cinema then attracted huge audiences, with some third of the population going at least once a week. The cinema introduced food flashes, as they were called, and there were about 200 made. They were only 15 seconds long, but each offered a handy tip delivered in a punchy, humorous way. Many cookery books were written during the war. Come into the garden, cook, by a certain constant spry. Or there was food without fuss, which has recipes for yum yum carrot bread, herring and potato mustard, or pink potato soup. Or there was a kitchen goes to war. Recipes for stuffed potatoes with butter, milk, and even an egg if you feel extravagant. Well, these children look happy, but of course they're not ice creams, are they? They're carrots on a stick. I don't know how many of these serving suggestions you would take up. Have you considered horse flesh? common enough in France, horse liver pâté, or what about rook pie? Or there was the famous Lord Woolton pie, looking on the outside exactly like a steak and kidney pie, and on the inside just like a steak and kidney pie, without the steak and kidney 
or there was soya getty, spaghetti cut to look like rice and served up in Chinese restaurants. Frying could be a problem. Why don't you try liquid paraffin? Because lard, of course, was rationed. Sometimes, said Theodora Fitzgibbon, we were reduced to liquid paraffin. At least we didn't suffer from constipation. Or you could reach out for the Biro book, Biro being a Newcastle company. Would you like some mock apricot tart made of grated carrots, plum jam and almond flavouring? Or what about mock crab, margarine, dried egg, cheese, salad dressing, vinegar, salt and pepper? Or there's nettle soup, young nettles, chives, barley or oat flour, some stock, salt and pepper. Well, we've looked at the three major ways of solving the food problem, but how was all this produce to be distributed? The answer, of course, is rationing. In Germany, rushing had been introduced on the outbreak of war and people had already got used to an austere diet. Of course, in Germany, the government had dictatorial powers that weren't, at least to quite the same extent, available in Great Britain. And before the war, there had been little attempt to interfere with the British diet this meant there was to be a painful adjustment, particularly in the early part of the war. Initially, the new British diet was worked out without any real reference to nutritional advice. It was simply a question of providing what is available. And here we see a typical adult ration for usually for the week. The government, however, guarantees a minimum amount of food on the ration. And it probably didn't look much different to what you can see here. Well, in addition to the minimum ration, there were other possibilities. The problem of foods that suffer from an erratic supply, such as tinned meats, fish and fruit, or rice or biscuits or beans, the government introduced the points system in addition to the basic ration. And the point system runs on a sliding scale, which is adjusted according to current supply. Originally, apparently, this was a German idea. Well, did rationing actually mean that everybody was treated equally? We know that all British citizens did receive the same amount of food. Unlike in Germany, where a differentiated system operated, which actually proved to be the better system. In Britain, the system was designed to foster a social consensus, but of course it was an unjust system. In normal day-to-day -day work, one requires about 2,000, 2,500 calories, but in heavy industry, you need about 4,000. And the main losers turned out to be working class women who sacrifice their own food for their working husbands or to their children and also families with adolescents also lost out. However, families with young children would do better. On the whole, the system worked quite well, but there were problems. There was, for example, no established pre-war distribution scheme for eggs which had not normally been imported. Well, the first allocation of controlled eggs under the American land lease system included millions of eggs, which had been coal stored and then left on a quayside in the New York docks in summer for a week or two. Says Lord Woolton, 
By the time the eggs arrived and the hatches were opened, the stench was unbearable. I arranged in Liverpool to transport truckloads of these eggs to a place called Skelmersdale, where there was a disused mine. I was told quietly that they were dropped down the mine. The basic ration was supplemented in three ways. There were factory canteens. It is difficult to consume 4,000 calories, the amount needed by a heavy worker. It's difficult to consume 4,000 calories a day if that energy must come from bulky food. And men in heavy industry complained bitterly over the lack of meat. In 1943, the government made it compulsory for all firms employing more than 250 people to set up a canteen. These can canteens serve double the meat allowance. 10,500 factory canteens are set up and 1,000 are set up in the docks. For the countryside, the rural pie scheme is set up for agricultural workers and meat pies are delivered to special centres by the WVS, Women's Voluntary Service. In addition, there were restaurants called communal feeding centres established in towns and cities. Churchill, however, disliked this name had a communist tinge to it, he felt, and he changed the name to British Restaurants. A typical menu might have been stuffed lamb, potatoes and cabbage, followed by date roll and custard and a cup of tea, all for 11 pence. However, only about 5% of people use these restaurants regularly. Well, why? Was it perhaps snobbery? I think in Gladys Cox's case of London, eating on the Finchley Road, it probably was. She said that the food was passable, but the clientele were a mixed bag and service was rough and ready. A navvy sat beside me in his working clothes. Of course, if you could afford it, there were ways around the rations. Restaurants and hotels were limited to a maximum charge of five shillings per meal, but they could get around this problem by charging high prices for wine or use of the dance floor. And so finally, we come to a couple of quick conclusions. And I do this in the form of a comparison between then and now. Well then, the Dig for Victory campaign was warmly received by the public and it seems to have succeeded in uniting people of all ages in a common cause. And maybe the coronavirus outbreak 2020 is doing something similar. But the Dig for Victory campaign meant that many old people would welcome the campaign as an escape from loneliness. There was a sense of belonging where all could play a role. And I wonder now whether or not, and I ask this as a question, I don't offer an answer, whether now our society is perhaps more selfish. It's become perhaps more impersonal through social media with less face-to-face -face contact. Is it a virtual, not a real society anymore? I leave the answer to yourselves. And finally, then, during the war, the public learnt to eat healthily and not to waste food. They began to take an interest in nutritional values, and usually this was for the first time. Now I leave you on the questions of, do we actually now eat less healthily? I suspect that the answer is that we do. We have perhaps too much fast food and takeaway food. There is certainly a problem in Great Britain of, ob of obesity, 
we now have vast choices on supermarket shelves. Fruit and vegetables have to be of the right shape, as if it mattered at all, particularly when your fate was in the balance of whether or not the country would be able to continue to feed itself during those hard and difficult years of the Second World War. Thank you very much, everybody, and goodbye.